These two cars are pretty unevenly matched. On my right is the 2023 Audi RS3. Four doors, five cylinders, and trick all-wheel drive. On my left is the 2020 Supra. Two doors, six cylinders, rear-wheel drive. Now on paper, they got about the same horsepower and they're similar in price. But let's find out which one is really better to drive. The RS3 was updated in 2022, and it shares the same platform as the A3 and of course the S3. And so we still get the five cylinder engine, which Audi says is the most powerful in production. I don't think there's any others. And right now in this current generation, we're making 401 horsepower and 369 pound feet of torque. They say that the power does come on a little bit earlier. And this car has a very trick all wheel drive system. And this car is all about modes. And frankly, it's a little bit confusing. I think you can sort of layer the modes on top of each other, but there is this RS mode on the steering wheel, which gives you this really cool dash. And then you can play with the dampers and the throttle and the transmission. And this car is able to send up to 50% of the power to the rear wheels. And what's really cool, it can send 100% of that power to the outside wheel. And that is supposed to reduce understeer. This car also has staggered wheels and tires. They are bigger on the front. They're 265, 19 on the front, 245 in the back. Let's see how this puppy behaves on some winding roads. Heading out into the canyons. We've got the transmission in automatic mode. I'm just gonna let it do its thing. And I've been driving this car a couple days and my impressions are that this car is really trying hard to impress the driver. It makes really good sounds. So going into this corner, going pretty moderately here no downshift which is fine it's in fourth gear if i give it a little bit of throttle give it like a little bit there it goes into third pretty quickly now there's sort of a lot going on in this car it's designed to feel visceral like listen to that engine oh sounds sounds really good it's very unique I would have hoped I got a downshift there, but the downshift was a little bit late. Now it does shift very quickly. I will give you that one. It does shift, it's pretty fast, but the transmission, seven speed DCT, feels a little bit laggy in terms of getting it to downshift. So I'm coming up to a tight corner here. It should downshift for me into second, but in fact, it didn't. It, uh, it upshifted immediately on exit. So transmission programming, I think, could use a little bit of work. But if I put it in manual mode, which I will do right now, so I'm in third, I'm gonna downshift to second. Okay, it actually didn't downshift to second. There we go. Now the shift levers feel really good, I will give you that, but even in manual mode, it is a little bit recalcitrant. So let's see how the understeer or oversteer is. I'm going to this corner of the sweeper pretty quickly. And you know, the back end comes out slightly. So I'd say they've done a pretty good job at reducing understeer quite a bit in this car. They've really, they've really tuned this chassis within an inch of its life, in my opinion. Oh, it sounds really, really good. But there is a little hint of turbo lag in here if you don't keep the thing completely on boil. And these are conditions that I don't think most people are gonna be driving in so much. I don't think most people are gonna be driving sort of under these conditions with this car in a canyon with very tight bends. And it is a lot of fun. I will give you that, it is a lot of fun, but not quite the ultimate Canyon Carver vehicle. This doesn't really compete with an M3 or an M4 Comp. Those cars are a little bit sharper. And this car is trying to feel sharp. The suspension tuning is pretty good, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit on the bouncy side here. But when you're off boost, it does take a second for that boost to build up. And that gives it, well, I call it, let's say it gives it some character. And that was a nice downshift there. The brakes are quite good in here. So very tight sweeper. It does squirt from corner to corner 
pretty quickly. So I guess in some respects, this is sort of a, a gentleman's, an executive canyon carver in some capacities. Oh, actually, I think this is a little bit better on the freeway, quite frankly, than, than in here. So the steering is not the strong suit in this car. It feels quite light, quite overboosted. And then when you have some speed in a corner, it sort of weights up, but it feels a little bit, feels a little artificial, in my opinion, the way it sort of weights up. And don't get me wrong, they've done a pretty good job, and this is a pretty fun car, and I'm, I'm basically being very, very picky here, having driven these canyons quite a few times with a lot of different cars. I sort of want to make these reviews in a way that I'm sort of pushing the car in a way that maybe most people really won't. Zero to 60. Oh. Huh. Felt pretty quick. Let's see what the number is. That was 3.8 forward, an altitude of about 1,700 feet. Audi says it should do 3.6, so at sea level, that sounds about right. The driver display screen is really big. It's bright, it has a super cool map. Audi was one of the first to do this and it has multiple different views. And of course you have Apple CarPlay and you can change the view from having a large display, which I never really want to give up. But if I do, I can just move the gauges like that and you can scroll through all the different menus. You've also got an RS mode, which is pretty cool too with this big tack and all the warning lights. So it's very nice, it's very configurable. The entire center stack is clean, it's elegant, yet it's still actually very functional. I like this simple metal piece that goes all the way across the dashboard. You have physical heating and ventilation controls. They're actually really nice to use. And the screen is very responsive indeed. And this particular version, which the technology package has the Bang & Olufsen audio system, which actually sounds superb. It sounds much better than most cars that I've heard at this price class. And in the bottom of the center stack, you've got your drive mode selector here. You've got a little cubby hole where you can put your phone, wireless charging, and a couple of USB ports. And then you've got your very interesting looking gear selector, which looks kind of weird, but actually it's quite functional and it's fairly intuitive. Now, one of the real strong points of this car is the engine. This engine, it's called the Daza, is fairly legendary in terms of drag racing. This makes about 401 horsepower in stock form. People are putting out a lot more power with aftermarket turbos, and so this exact car is actually a development car, and I'm gonna be following the build on this car. I can take you along, and we're gonna see how much more power we can make with this car and still keep it like a nice sort of gentleman's daily sleeper car. Don't change any bodywork. We're just gonna see how quick we can make this car go with as little dollars as possible. Let's go drive the Supra. In 2020, the Supra came with 335 horsepower. However, this particular one has been tuned to 382, which is the same amount of power that you get in the 21 and up. So the power figure should be fairly comparable to the RS3. We're on the same road. Let's see what the difference in feel and drivability is like. Quick zero to 60. So I do have it in sport mode, just like the RS3. Let's get on the gas. Now, both of these cars are very, very quick indeed. You can hear that this eight-speed automatic transmission actually shifts quite quickly. Downshifted there for me quite nicely. And so a couple things are immediately apparent between these two cars. First off, this has better throttle response than the RS3. When you're off boost, it doesn't take very long to get back into boost. In fact, it's almost instantaneous, I would say. And the transmission is actually a little bit more well into downshift too. 
Now, in terms of sound, they both have a nice little symphony of their own. Woo! Yeah, they're both pretty quick, too. And we'll say now, obviously, this has a shorter wheelbase to it, which gives it a little bit more of a hmm, kind of snip, snip, snip kind of thing. You can basically cut from corner to corner fairly easily, and it feels like there's just a little bit less weight management going on here with this car. Now, obviously, uh, getting oversteer in this car is not difficult at all. It is well known for that, and over the years, Toyota has tuned out the oversteer quite a bit, especially with the 23. There's some pretty big software improvements which have really reduced the understeer in the car. You can check out my review of the manual Supra. Man, this is pretty quick. I'm not sure if it's quicker than the RS3 or not. I think I think it is just for my butt dyno, sort of mid-gear. But the main thing that I notice is this is just more willing to give me power exactly when I want it. So steering feel. Now, I don't think that the Supra has ever really been a, a highlight of amazing steering feel by any means. Certainly not in this early model, this 2020. I think it's steering feel is okay let's put it that way it's a little bit numb feels a little over boosted a little artificial but they've improved it over the years but compared with the rs3 the steering actually feels a lot more natural it doesn't do funky things like a load up sort of suddenly in corners when you have a certain g-force in an artificial way. This just feels more natural. I think the steering in the RS3 is definitely not its strong point. And like I say, it's not the strongest point here either, but I do think it's better. Uh, now these seats are definitely better for performance driving. These have a lot more bolstering to them. And frankly, this is just more of a dedicated sports car than the RS3. The RS3 is a kind of do everything car and do everything pretty competently. We've certainly got a lot more passenger space back there got no passenger space back here at all and everything about this car is willing I would say in a more there's some understeer right there in a more organic way than the RS3 but we are really comparing apples to apples here I think the RS3 sounds amazing I think this engine sounds amazing too and we know from a tuning perspective that people are making tons and tons of horsepower out of this car. You can make a lot of power with this car. And in fact, this car has been tuned to 500 horsepower without any real hardware modifications. That's not with any special turbo. That's just with tuning and a little bit of E85. Woo, so much fun. The brakes are pretty good in here too. I wouldn't fault the brakes in the RS3 either. But these are cars with, you know, they've got pretty different missions if we're gonna be honest here. These are, these are not cars which I don't think a lot of people are comparing, but you know, I have seen the RS3 compared to many, many different cars online. It's kind of wild what people are looking at in comparison to that car, because it is a do-it-all kind of car. You don't really need two cars. And if you've got a Supra and you've got more than just, um, you know, a spouse or a significant other, you're, you're gonna need more space than what the RS3 allows. So dynamically, I think this is just more of a dedicated platform, a little more playful. It has a much shorter wheelbase. It's more willing to do what you want more right now, I would say. Even though it has big turbo power, really no lag in here at all. And everything about this car feels pretty dialed in. After all, they've been making this car for a few years right now. And with every iteration of the Supra, it just gets a little bit better to drive, in my opinion. 
This RS3 looks great with this Daytona gray. It has the black optics package. This also has the technology package and the sport exhaust. It runs about $65,000 and it's a really good driver on the freeway. And if you need a daily driver that seats more than just two people, this is definitely the right choice. It has a usable trunk. It has a back seat, although tiny. You can still put adults in there from time to time. And the Supra is really a whole different beast altogether. It's obviously a two-door sports car. It's not particularly practical. However, I think the engine is one of the strongest points of this car. The B58 has got so much torque. And the transmission programming, even though it's an automatic, I think is quite good. And it seems to upshift and downshift perhaps a little bit better than the seven-speed DCT, at least in my opinion. So truly, this is an apples and oranges comparison. If you can only have one car, you need something more practical, and you're willing to spend a few bucks, and you can find one, the Audi RS3 is definitely my pick for practicality. If you want something that is a little bit more of a super high performance car that has a ton of power and a ton of mod potential with the B58 engine, yeah, the Supra is the one to get, but for most people like me, it's gonna be a second car. I love the fact that Audi is doing a super unique engine. No one else is doing a five cylinder on the market right now. It sounds incredible, it's powerful, it's a lot of fun to drive and kudos to Audi for making something that is truly special in today's day and age where ICE cars are starting to slowly vanish. If you enjoyed this video, there's another one right over here. Thanks for watching.